And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bid we go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we Share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. All right, we have a brother Sammy who's going to come and, and sing for us today. Thou power through
how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when through the woods and harvest glades i wonder i hear the birds sing sweetly through the trees when i look down from lofty mountains grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou When Christ shall come with a shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I'm gonna bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great <coughs> thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou Don't we serve a great Lord? Don't we have a wonderful Savior, don't we? We are, we are in Romans chapter 5 this morning. We are going to, to celebrate a little bit that Savior and who we serve and uh, kind of just basically celebrate the Savior. I, I've said, everybody 
I, I don't know. I've said that so many times. I kind of worry sometimes that people are about, oh, we're doing celebrating Jesus. Well, wake up and enjoy that. I mean, how would that be a bad thing, right? I mean, if we just celebrated Jesus every Sunday, uh, technically we should celebrate Christ every day. Uh, so, but he does so much, and we are going to be looking at Romans chapter 5 because I'm praying that if someone is here today and they don't know Jesus, that they would wake up and realize that he is their Savior today, and then they could join in with the rest of us and celebrate him. And so we're looking at salvation, we're going to be looking at Christ, we're going to be looking at what all he does for us uh, this morning. So again, we're in Romans chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. Uh, so if you want to stand at this time for the reading of the word, uh, please do so. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength and due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only so, we, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and time to come to your house to be studying your word. And Father, we just praise you for sending Jesus Christ. We praise him for loving us enough to come and, and to be the sacrifice on the cross that we needed, Lord. We praise you uh, that he was willing to do that. We praise you that the tomb three days later is now empty and will forever be empty, Lord, that we serve a risen Savior who loves us, Father. We just pray that, that your word would be illuminated through your spirit today, that all uh, that hear it, Lord, would understand, that if there be someone that does not know Christ, Lord, that they would be convicted through that spirit and the word would be put on their heart and that they would come to believe and trust in him even today, Lord, and we should see souls saved. Father, we pray that for all of us who are saved, Lord, may we remember everything that Jesus does for us. And because of that, may we decide today in our hearts the purpose in our lives to lead lives according to his will, to sacrifice our time and our efforts and whatever it takes, Lord, to advance the kingdom, that we would give our lives over to him and put him as our, as our focus, Lord. Father, we lift up each prayer request that's been mentioned, Lord, for the families who's lost loved ones, we lift them up. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. For the praises we've heard this morning, we give thanks. Father, we ask that you be with our country and nation, Lord, as we see things that seemingly going awry. Let us remember that you are in control and that in the end, Jesus Christ is coming back and that he will rule and reign. Father, that, that as your people, Lord, we cannot lose in the end. Father, we praise you for these things, and we love you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So these are some just absolutely wonderful verses that, that just encourage us and uplift us and remind us of what Jesus does for us. If you go back, and I know verse 1 of chapter 5 says, therefore, and really we could look at the first four chapters of that to kind of get some context. Uh, but I think we can go and understand it even without. So if you want to study the first four chapters, uh, go right ahead. But it says, therefore, being justified by faith. And right there, we already talked about that in Sunday school class last week, but we are justified by faith. We are not justified. Justified means to be set free, means to be set back to square one, means to be brought back uh, to zero, means to be forgiven, all those different things. We're justified not by works, not by being good, not by who we are, not by what we have. It says we're justified by faith. 
Faith is how we are justified. Faith is how we are saved. Faith is what we stand on. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know, it's what we do. It's, it's who we are. It's, what we, it's the faith that we have. And so all those people working for salvation are going to come up short. All the people that think because of who they are, who their parents are, are going to come up short. The people being good are going to come up short. And only people that are saved that will be justified are the ones who put their faith in Jesus. Christ it was done for by him paid for by him given to us freely and all we have to do is believe it believe and trust in him he's literally offering eternal salvation and eternity with him the greatest most longest lasting gift ever and it costs nothing just simply believe today if you're here and you haven't trusted in Christ all you have to do is believe Believe He is the Savior of the world. Believe that He's convicting you. The Spirit right now is telling you He's talking to you. The Spirit right now is telling you He's talking to me. Wake up, believe, and trust through faith. There's never a better day than right now. It says, therefore, we are justified by faith. Notice, because of that faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people, they, the world wants to read that verse, and they want to make God to be this, this mean bully that's picking on people and this and that. The reason we don't have peace with God is because you rewind 6,000 years, and mankind failed. We sinned, didn't we? Adam and Eve ate that fruit of the tree. God gave them one silly rule. One. One little rule. Don't eat that fruit. Eat any other tree. Eat any other plant. Do whatever. Just don't eat that one tree. And I promise you, and I know this has to be true because this would be true if it was me, as soon as God turned around, they went, walked, and they stared at the tree. They looked at it. I wonder why we can't eat that one. Well, I don't know. What if we cooked it? Well, what's cooking? We never cooked before. I don't know. I mean, they're staring at that tree, lusting after that tree, wanting that tree. That tree looks good. Hey, God said we could eat that one. I know, but he said don't eat this one. And so mankind, this little, little serpent comes along, Satan comes along, the first lie ever told. Did God really say that? And 6,000 years later, Satan's lie is God's word really say that? Still the same lie. And so they eat that, so they're plunged into sin. Death came into the world because of Adam and Eve. And so mankind is born with the sin of Adam on us, needing a Savior. And so when it talks about peace with God, it's not God's just big, mean bully picking on us. It's because we need a Savior. In fact, God's not a bully. He's a benevolent Father who loved us so much that to fix our problem, He sent His own Son to die on the cross for us. That's not a mean, hateful God. That's a loving God. And that's a loving Savior. It says we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. It's not who we are. It's through Him by faith. It's free. That's not hate. That's love. Don't we have a loving Savior? Don't we have an amazing God? Don't we have this great salvation that's freely given to us if we would simply believe? How much more easy could it get? Mankind wants to make things complicated. Mankind wants to add to it to feel like we've earned something. <clears throat> the true child of God in humility realizes we don't deserve it. We cannot earn it. And the truth is every one of us has died deserving to burn in hell. But we have a loving Savior that said, wait a minute, not on my watch. You don't have to endure that. You don't have to go there. I will die for you if you'll simply trust me. You'll be saved for eternity. I mean, it's pure love in that verse. Is therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he says we because the author Paul is including himself. Paul was saved in the same way we are saved. Everyone for eternity has been saved in the same way by either believing that the Savior is coming or believing the Savior has came. The salvation of the world is in Jesus Christ. And Paul says we have that. Now look at verse 2. It says by whom also we have access again by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is Ephesians 2, 8, 9? By grace through faith. 
we see this mentioned here again in verse 2. We have access by faith into this grace. The grace of God. The grace of God that says even though mankind deserves to be destroyed, I'm going to send my son to die for him. Even though mankind deserves to be punished, I'm going to have grace and mercy. And I'm going to send salvation. And I'm going to save a bunch of people that didn't deserve it because I'm a loving God. We have access by our faith into that grace. And notice because of that grace, where it says wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, a child of God that's been saved by God should rejoice every single second of their life. I will never again be destined to burn in hell. I will never again be destined to suffer in hell. I'm going to be saved and I'm going to be secure because Jesus Christ gave me that salvation. We stand in that grace because of our faith. If that don't give us a reason to rejoice, you need to wake up and get saved. That's just all. If you can't rejoice in salvation, I'm willing to say you probably don't have salvation. Because the child of God that's saved, we're standing and rejoicing in that hope. That hope that I know and I'm assured that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'm assured of an eternal home. I'm assured that He's coming back. And nobody, no government, no Satan, not even 87,000 new government officials are going to take that salvation from me no matter what because my Savior's bigger and better than all of them. That is a blessed assurance, isn't it? That is a blessed hope. That hope of glory in God. This world's going to weigh us down. This world's going to make us suffer. This world's going to be depressing and heartache. It's going to try to weary and wear out the saints of God. But the saints of God have something this world don't have. And that's the Holy Spirit. And that's the assurance that Jesus is coming back. So because of that, on our worst day, we can still rejoice in that hope. It just breaks my heart to imagine lost people without Christ. How do you endure the world? How do you face tomorrow? It's no wonder people are depressed. How, how could you face tomorrow with it? Just, I don't understand it. I've tried. It baffles me. Child of God, we are blessed. And let's share that blessing with the world. How are we going to share that with the world? By telling other people Jesus died for everyone. Every man, woman, child, all race, creeds, and nationalities, Jesus Christ died for them all, and their salvation is in Him if they would believe. We've got to get about telling people that. He says, by whom we have access by faith in this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Did I lose anybody? That's usually where we lose people, right there. You know, you can build a 40,000-seat stadium church house in Houston if you tell everybody that God loves you, do whatever you want. But when you get to verses like this where it says, Hey, God's great. We're standing and rejoicing in His grace and mercy and glory, and we're even going to glory in tribulation. Everybody's like, Yeah, I'll go next door. And in America, we can go next door. I don't like what that preacher said. I'll go find one that I like what he said. You know how many people do that? You know how you really ought to find a church? One, let the Spirit lead. And two, find the most biblical church you can find. Let it be biblical, not convenient. If you have to drive a few extra miles, people drive an hour to go to work every day, but they won't drive ten minutes to find a biblical church. Eternal consequences. It says we glory in tribulation. Why? Because we know that tribulation worketh patience. We looked at this this morning in Hebrews a little bit. Verse 4, patience, experience, and experience hope. We actually talked about this last week too. And hope maketh not ashamed. So are we going to grow in the Lord? Are we going to grow in our faith? Are we going to grow in our walk? You know, we all talk about faith, and you know, it's easy to have faith in Christ, but the more our faith is tested, the stronger it gets. When we learn to walk by faith, when we learn to live by faith, when we learn patience and we get that experience. And by the way, experience kind of is a wonderful thing. So when I look around here, I don't see the aged, I see the experienced. And we're going to need that in, in classes. Come tonight, volunteer. 
But we got patience and experience, and experience brings hope. When you've been there, you know what's going to happen. When you face a fa- when you face tribulation and you face heartache and you face trouble, and Jesus Christ carries you to the other side, and you realize I'm only here because of Jesus, that gives us experience so that the next time we face problems, we know and believe that Jesus will carry us to the other side because we've been there before. When you study the Old Testament and you see Moses and he grows, that for when Moses first goes to Egypt and Pharaoh tells him no and the people get mad, Moses is like, Lord, what's happening? What am I doing? And as you read time and time again, God works with him. By the time you get Moses in the wilderness, the people are going crazy. And Moses is like, I got this. Lord, you know what them people's doing. Let's fix this. He grew and learned and had experience. When we face heartache, it hurts. It suffers us. But it grows us and it matures us. And we need mature, grown Christians teaching young people because they ain't got it yet. We have to grow and mature. And it says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Simple question. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Better not be. What well, is the Bible? Back up to, you know, to turn to Romans what is 16 For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How many children of God today are willing to stand up in the face of persecution and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus is the only Savior of the world. All other religions are fake. All other gods are fake. The Bible is true word for word. And any man-made ideal or science that goes against the Bible is fake. How many Christians are willing to stand up and say, I'm not ashamed of my beliefs because my Savior died for me. I'm going to stand for Him. I'm going to proclaim Him because I believe in Him. How many are going to do that today? How many of us will do that today? Huh, He got my verse. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? It is the power of God unto salvation. And I love the next several words. This ain't even in my notes. This is free. To everyone that believeth. There's a lot of people in the world try to say only the chosen are saved or only a select people are saved or only this group or that group is saved. I praise God that Jesus died for everyone because if it was a chosen group, I wouldn't have made the cut. And how many of us would have? But it says the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believe it. Not works, not earns, believe it. To the Jew first, also the Greek. It's the power of God. So you go back there to Romans chapter 5, and you go back to verse 5 and realize with that tribulation, with patience, with experience comes hope, and that hope makes us not ashamed. When you've walked through the fire, you come out stronger on the other side. I guarantee you, if you could go back and see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had the faith to stand up and say, hey, King, we don't care if you're going to put us in the fire. We're not worried about it. They were Faithful. You get them in the fire, Jesus is in the fire, they come out. If you had to talk to them then, their faith had increased. They knew Jesus would be with them, but they fully went into that fire expecting to die and go to be with him. They didn't know he was coming to see them. So when they got out, they walked a little bit taller with more faith. Moses, like I said, grew. Noah, when he got grew. Every time and again, the man of God that stood for the word of God and the power of God, after he endured, he got stronger. We looked at Job last week. Job was a faithful man. I promise you, if there'd have been a Job chapter 43, it'd have talked about how faithful he was after that. Our faith grows after we're tested but we're all leery of asking for that testing aren't we Isaiah here am I Lord send me we all talk about that verse God's calling Isaiah here am I Lord send me we, we fail to keep going where Isaiah has a question he goes Lord how long you know a couple of years you know I'll get back to the family and God says till everything's in ruin and destruction and by the way nobody's going to listen to you well that's a calling isn't it our calling is almost that today when are we going to quit when the world ends when Christ comes back is people going to believe God never tells us preach and see people saved he says preach and I'll do the rest our faithfulness is not based on what happens our faithfulness is on us being faithful the seeds that are planted the souls that are saved that's on God What changes lives in them? I can't preach anyone into heaven. Only God can do that. 
Only Jesus can save anybody. All we can do is tell them the way and introduce them to Christ. It's up to them to believe, and it's up to him to save and secure and seal. And so we need to realize that, going back to verse 5, hope maketh not a shame. We better not be ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, I know we're in a Baptist church, and we don't talk a lot about the Holy Ghost because of other denominations that have just horrified that and made it stuff that it's not. But we have a Holy Ghost in us that can lead God and direct, strengthen, and comfort more than anything else in the world. We should celebrate the Holy Ghost. How do we have strength on a bad day? The Holy Ghost. How do we know what Christ wants? The Holy Ghost. How are we sealed and secured until the day of redemption? The Holy Ghost. We need to celebrate that. What is going to lead our business meetings? The Holy Ghost is moving and leading and touching hearts. I believe today if you're lost, the Holy Spirit is in here today convicting you that you're lost. If you are saved and you're not being as faithful as you could be, the Holy Ghost is convicting you to be more faithful. Whatever God's calling you, the Holy Spirit's calling you, and on top of that, when you accept, here am I, Lord, send me, the Holy Ghost is going to go with you and encourage you and, and, and help you do what you need to do. Jesus is not going to say, go teach that three-year-old class and leave you alone. He's going to be in there with you. He can do it. How did I teach a teen class? There's a lot of days it was praying, praying, praying. I wish there was some way that teen class could hear this. only way I got through y'all was prayer. And the only way, Mark, testify with me, brother. How, the, how have you been teaching teens on Wednesday night? <laughs> well, you're still there because of the Holy Spirit, amen? Uh, your wife's like, if the Holy Spirit getting to take care of me, a little, no, I'm just kidding. But the Holy Spirit helped you teach a teen class. The Holy Spirit helped Stan teach the teen class in the morning. The Holy Spirit helped you teach it. The Holy Spirit is the only reason I'm standing here today because I'm not a natural speaker. I'm not a natural leader. And really, I'm kind of like an old hound dog. I'm happy curled up on the porch napping. But I'm standing here today because the Holy Spirit is empowering us to do so. And we're all here today because of the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. When we love God and we're not ashamed, the Spirit can do wonders. The reason the Spirit isn't working with you is because you're quenching the Spirit. The Spirit of God saying right now, you can, and you're saying, not me. I know, I fought it for years. Oh, you need to be preaching. <laughs> oh. Not me. I don't want to do that. People will be looking at me. I'll have to go to church on Sunday. I'll have to stay awake during the service. Holy Spirit, yes, you can. I mean, when we start start showing the love of God and that hope and we just accept that and we start serving, there's no limit to what God can do with you. No matter who you are, God can use you. Look at verse 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Basically the author saying, look, it's logical that some people would die for good people. That, that's clear. That makes sense. But, but Christ, it says in verse 6, when we were, had no strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And when you go to verse 8, it says, but God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait till we deserved it. Christ didn't wait till we were righteous. Christ Christ didn't wait and only die for good people. When we were weak, when we were without strength, when we were sinners, Jesus died for us anyway. Whew. Praise the Lord. If Jesus waited on someone to deserve it, there wouldn't be one person in eternity with him. <laughs> Not even Paul. Paul said, you know, the Lord died for sinners of who I am chief. And if Paul can't get in, I ain't no way we are. I mean, he wrote the whole New Testament practically. Moses, Noah, all, even Enoch. And everybody, well, Enoch was translated, I get that, but I promise you, Enoch sinned himself. God just went ahead and took him early before the flood. None of us would make it, but we don't have to because it said while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The author included himself, didn't he? Us. Christ died for all today. If you're here, Jesus died for you. 
Today you may be sitting there wondering, am I saved, am I lost? If you're wondering, you're lost. The Spirit is telling you that. The Spirit is telling you, you need Jesus. I'm telling you through the power of the Spirit that Jesus knows you, He loves you, He died for you. The Spirit, through Him, is telling you, He's standing there waiting on you. With open arms, waiting. The moment you call, Jesus, I realize I'm lost. Jesus, please save me. The moment you believe and call upon His name, His arms are wrapped around you. That Spirit is filled inside of you. And you're saved, secured, and delivered for eternity. Immediately at belief and asking, you're saved for eternity. It's not, well, we'll see. It's not, I'll think about it. It's not, maybe. It's not, you do this and that. It's, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please save me and believe that He will. And the moment you believe and call, you're saved for eternity no matter what. No matter who or what else you do. No matter if you decided to sell it, if you decided to get rid of it. I saw a silly article I didn't read. It's on Facebook. It said, can I sell my soul to the devil? I thought that's stupid. If you're already lost, the devil ain't paying for it because he already owns it and if you're saved you can't sell it anyway that's an ignorant thing to even consider because once you're saved you're a child of God and Jesus will not let you go Whew, we have a great savior even if we're like the worst little three did anybody ever have rotten kids you trying to hold their hand and show them love and they're kicking and stomping and spitting and even if we're kicking, stomping, and spitting, trying to let go, Jesus won't let go. Because we have a wonderful Savior who loves us even though we're little heathens. Right? So let's just forget being little heathens. Let's try to be good. Let's try to be good kids. We have a Heavenly Father holding our hand. We ought to be walking tall with a smile on our face. Praising God for Him. Because while we were sinners, He died for us. That's how much He loves you. It's how much He loves you then. It's how much He loves you now. And so we see that. You go into verse 9. He says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We've been talking to lost people for a little while now. I'm going to talk to saved people for a second. Realize what these verses are saying in verse 9 and 10. If Jesus loved you and died for you when you were a sinner, now that you're reconciled, now that you're His child of God, now that you're a brother of Christ, how much more? does he love you now and will lead you if you'll just let him you look at verse 10 says when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son how are we reconciled by jesus christ much more now that we're reconciled now that we're a child of god now that jesus is calling our brethren we shall be saved by his life we are not saved just to get out of hell free we are saved to live our lives for jesus christ and see other people saved we are saved to be living testimonies, living examples. We are saved to be witnesses to a lost world. Like the man that Jesus healed when he was blind and the man really didn't understand what was going on and the Sadducees and the Pharisees asked him, said, what's going on? He says, I don't really know, but I was blind and now I see. You may not know every page of the Bible. You may not understand everything theologically, but if you've been saved by Jesus Christ, you can tell somebody how you were saved. I was saved by believing in Jesus Christ and you can be too i was blind but now i see <laughs> some of the greatest words and illustration in the bible right there man without christ is blind but the moment we believe and trust we shall see who we should really be we should see where we should be going if jesus loved us and died for us when we were lost now that we're alive he ain't going to leave us alone he didn't just save us and say good luck Hope you figure it out. He saved us to be with us every step of the way. The Spirit's inside of us leading. He gave us the Word of God, that Bible you got in your hand, so that we can know what to do and where to do it. He gave us and continues to give us everything, strength and comfort, hope and love, and everything else. He saved us to live for Him. Child of God, are you living for Him? If there's anything in your life before Jesus, you need to get that fixed. You say, blah, 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 I don't really care about all the blah, 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 but. Jesus should be our first priority 
and then everything else will fall in line. When you get that messed up, everything gets messed up. It'd be like trying to do the alphabet, B, C, D, A, you know. It's going to mess it all up. Math class, one, two, three. If we got those jumbled around, it'd mess it up. When Jesus is first, and then the rest of it falls in line. If you put family before Christ, there's going to be a problem. Jesus said, you know, the Bible says hate mother, hate father, and that's not talking about literal hate. That means we should have him first. If you put your job before Jesus, there's going to be problems. If you put anything before Jesus, there's going to be problems. But when we put Jesus first, everything else will work out. Jesus is the only way that family is going to work out. Jesus is the only way that marriage is are going to work out. Jesus is the only way that your job is going to work out. Jesus is the only way that our lives will work out. When we are His ch brethren, when we are God's children, when we are saved by the blood of Christ, we should live every day believing we are saved by the blood of Christ. We should live every day in appreciation for what Jesus did, does, and will do for us. We should live every day looking up for that glorious return because He is coming back. Are we living our lives for Jesus? And I know that, you know, the world tries to bog you down. I know that the world is designed to bog you down. Our entire institutions are designed to celebrate people that are living out of wedlock and punish those who get married. We'd be rich if we were divorced. Since we're married, we're taxed to death. The entire institution that we celebrate, our or that we live under, are designed to bring in immorality and sin and keep the child of God weary. That's just the facts of the world. We're just going to have to accept it. We can't change the world, but we might change one life. If we live faithfully, if we are living testimonies, if we're serving God, if we're given what we have, if we're, and I know some are, some are older, some are this, some are that, we all don't have the same amount of time and energy anymore, but if some gives a little, God's only wanting you to give what you can give. And by the way, what you have to give is only there because He's given it to you the first place. Kind of like tithing. Oh, well, I can't tithe, I can't tithe. Well, you watch out, God's going to take away the rest of your money. You only have money because of the Lord. You only have strength because of the Lord. You only have energy because of the Lord. What God wants from you, He's given to you anyway. You should give it back to Him. Live in our lives for Him. And then we go into verse 11. It says, not only so, not only live our lives for Him. It says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now received the atonement. Atonement means reconciliation. So he's, he's reminding them that we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have life because of Jesus Christ. We joy in tribulation because of Jesus Christ. At this verse, he reminds that we've received the atonement, our reconciliation. And remember, going back to verse 1, we have peace with God because of Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus Christ, we can have joy. It says we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have joy in your life, it's because you haven't put Jesus first. The most miserable person on earth is not a lost person. They're too lost to know they're miserable. The absolute worst, most miserable person in life is a child of God that is not faithful. Because the Holy Spirit conviction is wearing you out. The Holy Spirit is telling you plain out, you need Jesus. You need to be faithful. You need to be doing the right thing. And if you're fighting against that, as Jesus told Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It'd be like trying to... Anybody ever seen a cattle prod? Anybody ever... You know, everybody knows what a cattle prod is. Nice big old rod with some batteries and electric. And you choo -choo, and it zaps people. We used to sell cattle prods in Arkansas. And I tried and tried to let the guy working with me. Let me test it on him. He wouldn't do it. 
But you got these big old cattle prods, zap, zap, and you can move a whole cow with one. Somebody told me one time they shocked a pig and they thought it killed it. I mean, this thing's got some power behind it. It'd be like a bunch of cattle prods and you're trying to fight through them to get to the sin door. God is pricking you at your heart through conviction, telling you don't go that way. And we're fighting through the zaps and the shocks. And we're hard. No, turn around and go the way God wants you to go. That's how we find joy when we surrender our lives to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you saved me. I'm just going to live for you. When we stop fighting against the cattle prods and just go again with the current of Jesus, with the current of the Holy Spirit, when we just go with His will, we will find joy because Jesus is there. So today, if you're here and you have not realized that Jesus is the atonement, that Jesus brings justification. That Jesus is the only way of salvation. That Jesus is your Savior. He's waiting on you. That His blood was shed for you. If you have not figured that out yet, I pray that you wake up soon. I pray that you realize the only God in the world is our God and the only Savior of the world is His Son, Jesus Christ. The only way of eternal life. There's two choices. There's eternal life with Christ or there's burning in a lake of fire, suffering and agony for eternity. Why? Not because of what you've done, but because you failed to do one thing. The only sin that sends you to hell is unbelief. Believe and trust in Jesus Christ and no matter what else you've done today, you will be saved. I pray that you wake up. None of us know what tomorrow's bringing. None of us know what's coming next. But today, if you're here and the Spirit's convicting you, you realize you're lost, believe in Christ, and today you will be saved. And then, child of God, as the author said, much more than that, since, we, since Jesus loved us before, now that we're His children of God and brethren of Christ, how much more does He love us? Do you still love Him? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we love Christ, we should be willing to tell others about Christ. When we have good news in our lives, whether it's a new grandbaby being born, whether it's a giant fish we caught, whether it's winning some you know, race that we were driving in, whether it's getting a promotion or job, we like to tell people, child of God, we know the Savior of the world. Let's not be ashamed. Let's tell somebody. And let's live for Him, sacrificing anything that is needed to advance His kingdom. When we finally surrender, Lord, I surrender all. When we finally, truly surrender all, that's when we find joy. So as the song leader comes and the musicians come today, again, if you need Jesus, it's belief and trust and you will be saved. Child of God, there's so many opportunities here. We, we have so many needs. There's so many opportunities to serve. I don't know what your excuse is, but if you flip over, you don't have to turn there, but if you flip back to Exodus, and God sets a burning bush on fire, and Moses walks up to it, and God says, Moses, I need you to work for me, and Moses has excuse after excuse after excuse. After about the fourth one, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled. And finally, Moses shut up and did what God wanted him to do. I've been there. You're miserable fighting against what God wants you to do. But when you surrender and just accept that whatever God's will is, he's already paved the way and he's already going to supply everything I need to fulfill it, you find peace and you find joy. Whatever's on your heart, whatever you need, as we stand, whatever your need is, go to the Lord, find it today as we sing.